communication sure has gotten easier with all of these new technologies. Hang on. But it still can get a little messy. The fundamentals of communication are still the same. This year's theme for National History Day is communication is the key to understanding. We will look at the importance of and the differences between using primary and secondary sources. And we're going to meet people whose jobs depend on good communication, including authors, athletes, and historians. We are also going to learn how museums use storytelling to communicate with their visitors and the stories objects themselves can tell. We will also highlight ways people communicate, like Zoom or just talking to each other. We're going to look at communicating through other languages, and we'll show you how you can communicate with the future. This, this is, is STEM in 30. 30. Marty, you're muted. Primary sources are immediate, first-hand accounts of a topic from people who had a direct connection with it. Examples include newspaper reports by reporters who witnessed an event, photographs, video or audio that captured an event, speeches, diaries, letters and interviews with people who were involved in the event. Secondary sources are one step removed from primary sources, though they often quote or otherwise use primary sources. Examples include textbooks, biographies, and political commentary. Throughout the program, we will be using these symbols to show you what is a primary source and what is a secondary source, because we know sometimes that can be confusing. When you see this, it means you're learning about a primary source. When you see this, it means that you are learning about a secondary source. Primary sources also include objects like these, and museums are filled with them. In 2007, the U.S. Postal Service decorated 400 mailboxes to look like R2-D2 in order to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Star Wars. They placed them throughout the country. This object helps the museum tell the story of the importance of imagined spaceflight. Before you had a phone that fit in your pocket, you might have used one of these. This Mercury spacecraft-shaped phone booth came from NASA's Kennedy Space Center's Visitor's Center. It helps the museum tell the story of the impact that human spaceflight had on society. These objects and many others in the museum help tell the story of the history of communication. Communication takes many different forms. After World War I, airmail pilots learned to follow the iron compass, better known as railroad tracks. This method of navigation wasn't always efficient and didn't work well at night. Light beacons were constructed to allow pilots to navigate at night. The last Federal Airway beacon was shut down in 1972 and became part of the collection of the National Air and Space Museum. This is the backup spacecraft for Telstar, the world's first active communication satellite, one that can receive a radio signal from a ground station and then immediately retransmit it to another. This satellite allowed for the first transatlantic television transmissions. Observing this satellite, you can see that it was powered by solar panels and had a fairly small antenna. This is the Atlas Agena launch console. It was used in the 70s and 80s to launch Agena missiles from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. By looking at this object, you can learn what technology was used to communicate with these missiles. Sometimes we get to hear an amazing story from the person that lived it. Oral histories are an excellent example of primary sources. Gene Kranz was a flight director on Gemini through Apollo. He's probably most famous for his role in bringing the astronauts home safely on Apollo 13, but he was also there for the Apollo 11 moon landings. Gene Kranz's job relied heavily on communicating to ensure the safety and well-being of the astronauts. Flight directors have probably got one of the simplest job descriptions in America. It's only one sentence long. 
It says the flight director may take any actions necessary for crew safety and mission success. During the course of the mission, there is no higher authority. As flight director, you know, it's interesting, the kind of relationship you must establish with the astronauts. They have to have absolute belief that you are going to operate in a fashion that is going to basically assure their safety, but also give them the opportunity to accomplish their objectives. You want crisp, correct, concise, convincing. Those are the elements of effective communications, and we work very hard in mission control. We don't have time for a lot of words. They become very terse. You can say a one word that communicates a problem. You can say one word that communicates, I'm ready, we're go. Retro, go, Fido, go, guidance, go, control, go, telecom, go, GNC, go, ecom, go, surgeon, go. In preparation for a mission, I would take and I would decompose my go, no, go points, the mission roles, spacecraft systems, what were the critical issues, each point. And I would put it down on a timeline-oriented piece of paper, being able to see what is happening before it happens. As I studied and prepared for the mission, by the time the mission came along, I knew what all the normal things were, so I could very rapidly address anything that didn't fit this pattern. Capcom, we're go for landing. You know, there's some times when you get ready, uh, event, lunar landing. You know, this to me is probably one of the most challenging events myself and my team will ever face in that entire life. And as this team comes together, you start getting the emotions, you get the feeling, you get the depth. Things are about ready to happen here. And it's about time now for the final movement of the symphony. You're so proud of the kids you got working for you. You're so proud of doing this as an American to sit down and say, hey, I'm just a dumb little fighter pilot from Toledo, Ohio, and here I am in this place called Mission Control. Apollo was the predecessor of all of the work that we would do in future exploration space. It was the beginning. It was the first time we ever left the Earth's environment. You might talk about the moon, you talk about Mars, you talk about the planets. Basically, this is where it all started. Good. Roger. Primary sources come directly from the people who live them. We'd like to share some primary sources with you that you may not have thought about. The history of sports mirrors the history of our country, and professional athletes are primary sources. Here are some professional athletes talking about the importance of communication both on and off the field. Communication, communication, communication. I say it three times because it's the most important thing in the line of work that I'm in. But being a quarterback, playing in the NFL, I have to inspire the people around me and motivate them. And that's why you play quarterback. That's why you get a chance to lead a group of men. It's one of those things that I can get farther in my career and what I want to do if the people around me also have the same goals and same motivation. I'm part of that. I have to communicate to everybody. I have to know what everyone's doing, and I have to make sure that those lines of communication are, are clear and open. It's a lot of hard work to get to this job and to be in this role. There's a lot of things behind the scenes that people don't really see. It's those moments that make you better and make you stronger and allow you to get to where you are. In order to achieve anything in life, you have to work together with other people. We work towards a common goal, and without each other, we couldn't accomplish anything. On the ice, if you communicate well, you're gonna do well. When you are playing, you have to communicate with your line mates on the ice. And when you communicate, for example, about a power play, about a face-off situation, it's the same thing that I do in the booth. And it just doesn't happen with the flip of the finger or the flip of the switch. As an analyst, got to listen to everybody and then make a concise statement to get involved in the conversation. Oh, she fires. Rask made the save and he'll cover. <laughs> and you can see I now why Kuznetsov does it. Yep. I was very good at listening and translating because 
as an analyst and you have to listen often in both your ears. So I got to really maintain good focus so that I can put some good stories over the air that will make the game more interesting. He has just joined an exclusive club. That's the most difficult part of my job. I tell kids that I coach all the time, go out, tell people what you want. No need to tiptoe around people all the time. You have to let people know where you're at and what you want and why you want these things. It's something that I've had to practice because how else is everyone going to know to help you to get there? Ugh, I can't find it. Hidden Figures isn't here. It's probably in the library and not the archives, but it is a great book. It focuses on early women mathematicians hired by NASA. They were called computers, but they weren't actually computers. It was written by Margo Lee Shetterly. She collected all of those stories and then wrote them into the book, and then that book was turned into the incredible movie. It is actually a terrific example of a secondary resource. Let's head over to Margo Lee Shetterly, learn what inspired her and the importance of communication. Hidden Figures really came out of a conversation that I had between my, my husband and my father talking about some of the women that my father had worked with at NASA. He's a retired NASA Langley research scientist and knew many of the women, worked with many of the women that I wrote about in my book. And so really that first conversation sparked a lot of curiosity, which really set me down the road to researching and then writing what would become Hidden Figures. I think that being able to communicate clearly, to speak to people, to have a conversation with people, to write, to understand what you're thinking and to be able to write clearly so that other people understand it, to be able to read what other people have written and listen to what they're saying, those are skills that are going to benefit you regardless of what your career, whether you're a mathematician or a scientist, excellent communication skills will take you throughout your entire career and you will never regret having worked on, on that particular part of your skill set. True failure is not making a mistake. You know, true failure is failing to learn from those mistakes. And real success comes out of seeing those failures analyzing what happened, taking it on the chin, picking yourself up again, and moving forward with that new knowledge. If you look at successful people over time, nobody who is successful fails to make mistakes, but they may fail to learn from those mistakes. I am standing in front of the Apollo 11 Command Module, Columbia. And this is Space Shuttle Discovery. We want to show you the importance of objects and the stories they tell. And these objects do tell stories, but they don't do it by themselves. They require observation and interpretation. If you look at the bottom of the command module, you can see the heat shield. This protected the astronauts upon re-entry. It's been badly burned and is even chipped in some places. The shuttle tiles behind me definitely tell the story of the angle of entry of the space shuttle and they don't have the same burn marks like the Columbia Command Module. Together, these two artifacts tell the story of the innovation and improvements in technology. You can learn a lot by looking at objects, but sometimes you can't get very close to the Wright Flyer or the Space Shuttle or other things in our collection, but you can always look at images. Let's head over to an expert to learn more about what you can learn from an image. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lavasser, a curator at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. And when I'm not doing my curatorial work on exhibitions, I'm doing research with images. The reason I do research with images as opposed to just looking at text is that images can tell us so much about a particular event. You may not remember something that happened yesterday, but if you had a photograph of it, you might be able to remember more about what happened. So I like to look at images as almost like texts where you can read them and you try to gather information just like you would gather information from reading. There's a whole bunch of things that you might notice that you didn't notice before. And now here's Tom Crouch, curator emeritus, to talk about another very famous photograph. The picture was taken on December 17, 1903. They, it's about 10.35 in the morning. They're at a place called the Kill Devil Hills. Now on this first flight, Orville was doing the piloting. 
He only kept the airplane in the air for about 120 feet, uh, 12 seconds. They made four flights that morning, and uh, each one was a little longer than the one before it. When you look at this photograph, what are you really looking at? These two biplane wings, they're covered with unbleached muslin, and you have wood struts. This thing out here in front of the airplane is the elevator, and the elevator gives you control in pitch. This is the rudder, and it is what does yaw. The engine is right there. It has an aluminum engine block to cut down on the weight, and the engine drives the propellers. If you look at the airplane, there, it doesn't have any wheels. That's because they're gonna fly from sand, then the wheels would sink into the sand. So the notion they came up with was to run the airplane down a monorail track. And as you can see from the photograph, that day, the airplane didn't have to run very far down the track to take off. As you can see, it's not even over the end of the track and it's already in the air. If you look back here, you can see the outline of the wing in the sand. Now, how come it's outlined in the sand? Well, before they started the flight, everybody was walking around the airplane, checking things and so on. So where the wing was at the beginning of the flight, they outlined with their feet, which is kind of neat. So this box with the wires coming out of it is a coil box, and that's where they get the uh, electrical power to get the engine going. There you have it. That's kind of deconstructing the photograph of the world's first airplane on its first flight. We have a lot of airplanes in our collection, and one of my favorites was flown by Anne and Charles Lindbergh. It was called the Tingamasartog. It got its name when a little boy painted the word on the side of the plane. And when we were doing a new exhibit, I asked the historians that I was working with, are we saying the name of this plane correctly? Does anybody know? And they said, no, but that's a really good thing for you to research. So like you, I went out and researched. I made a lot of connections and I asked a lot of questions. What I learned was that we were saying the name of the plane right, Tingamasar Tog, which means one that flies like a great bird. The last thing I learned was that language changes over time. Where Tingamasar Tog originally meant one that flies like a great bird, now if you're in Greenland and you're going to catch an airplane, it's spelled the same, but pronounced Timmy Sar Talk. NASA astronaut John Harrington is a member of the Chickasaw Nation and flew on STS-113. And just as technology evolves, so does language. Hi, my name is John Harrington. I'm a former NASA astronaut. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma, and I participated in the uh, assembly of the space station. Wrote a children's book called Mission to Space, published through my tribe, the Chickasaw Press. My inspiration was my dad uh, was a pilot gave him my first flying lesson. The neat thing about this book is in the back we have um, an English to Chickasaw uh, dictionary uh, for a few of the words that are actually in the book. So someone asked me what was an astronaut called? Well, you know, you don't have a name for astronaut. So the Chickasaw language uh, group committee came together and said, so astronaut would be Abba Noah, meaning above walker, Abba, above, Noah as walker. Chikasha Abba Noah would be my name. A few of the words to fly is waka. Waka, fly. We have space shuttle is Piniwaka. Piniwaka, the flying canoe. That's pretty cool. It's neat because it's a very descriptive language. And so they, they use descriptive words to describe what they're talking about. For example, gravity. What is gravity? You know, what, what's the descriptor for that? So they say holds it at the ground. Yakni Oyokli. Yakni Oyokli. So they use different words to Striving. A lot of the words um, I'm still learning too in the process. Base suit, say Abanoa, above walker, and Inafka, clothes, above walker, clothes. So that would be a space suit. So I think it's one of the few, probably one of the only books that has a, a Chickasaw as a, a vocabulary, native vocabulary uh, in a space book. Hey. The museum doesn't just collect airplanes and spacecraft. 
We also have archives that collect papers, and photographs, and even scrapbooks. Let's check out some of the journals and scrapbooks in our collection. Hi, welcome to the National Air and Space Museum Archives. I'm Elizabeth Borgia and I'm one of the archivists on staff here. The National Air and Space Museum Archives holds historical materials that chronicle the history of aviation and space flight all the way from early ballooning to the modern space program, Space Shuttle and Beyond. Material that can range from letters and correspondence, technical manuals, we have three million photographs, materials on microfilm, records from corporations that are long gone, and also people who are still very much with us, like modern astronauts. Some of my favorite collections that we have are our diaries and scrapbooks. They really give you insight into somebody's life. This is a diary that we call the Yamada Diary. It is actually in Japanese. Unfortunately, we know very little about the Yamada who gave the name the Yamada Diary. So this is a photograph of, we believe his name is Yamada Hiroshi. And now that we've gotten inside the diary, you'll see what is so beautiful about this, is in addition to pasting in photography, Yamada was an artist. And so he captured a lot of what he experienced through art. What he chose to commemorate, just even in the drawing, says something about him and what he was trying to communicate about his life. You can see that here, we actually do have a quick translation that one of our Japanese speaking volunteers made of this particular picture, which is Manchurian girl on the train to Harbin. This is one of my all time favorite collections in the archives. It's called the Ruth Law Scrapbook. Ruth Law was actually one of the first American women to earn her pilot's license. She learned how to fly herself and earned her license in November 1912. One of the first things that Ruth Law did upon earning her license was determine that she was going to help other women fly. What she did, she actually sold passenger rides. So what you'll see on this page is a certificate of flight with Ruth Law. In 2020, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. And in this scrapbook, on this particular page, you'll see that Ruth has pasted a Votes for Women rosette. These were worn by suffragists who were women working towards the vote. But underneath this ribbon is what is known as an editorial cartoon, a drawing of Ruth Law up in the clouds. We know it's her because her little Suitcase says Miss Law, and she's up there saying, whoopee, votes for women. So this is definitely showing that Ruth Law was a part of the suffrage movement. And with all these things that we've shown you today, you can try this at home. Keep a journal or diary. Some people write every day. Some only keep a journal while traveling or during an important event. Either way is fine. Just pick what works for you. Carry a sketchbook with you. Maybe you don't like to write, but you like to draw. Think pictures and videos. Photos and videos are a great way to tell your story. Both mark a moment in time. Think of all your back to school photos. Even silly videos shared with friends help to tell a story. <laughs> Scrapbook. These are a great way to decoratively collect and display photographs and mementos, and if you keep them updated, you can collect a lot of stories over time. Now that you've decided on a way to tell your story, keep it safe and make it last. First, skip the stickers and the tape. Yes, stickers add a certain bling, but the sticky stuff, the adhesive, can cause damage. The best way to attach your mementos to your pages is with photo corners, or put them in a plastic cover, and then attach them into your book or album. Second, record names, dates, and places. You can write that under your photos, sketches, or writings. Doing this will not only help you remember what you were up to, it'll also help anybody who comes along later to figure out what you were doing. Third, keep your digital up to date. Computers crash, so don't store everything on one computer. Pick an external way to store your memories, and remember to keep up to date with your technology. Follow these simple steps and maybe one day your collection may be highlighted in an archives. We've learned about a lot of ways that you can express yourself. 
And one of those ways is through fiction. Let's head over to ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, and learn how she learned to express herself through fiction and to believe in herself always. I've always been a science and math person. That's what meteorology was all about, and that's what my life was about. And I actually did used to love to write. Fifth, sixth grade, I remember enjoying the creative writing process, but I got a B on one of my first papers in my English class. And the teacher said, well, just do better next time, and maybe writing's not your thing. And from that point, at 13 years old, through not too long ago, I believed I was not good at writing. I stopped writing and I focused on math and science, which worked out. But when I got pregnant with my son, I had this epiphany. I was trying to find weather books for babies and I just didn't see any. I thought, you know what? I'm not a writer, but I could handle writing 60 words for a baby book about weather. And when I took that idea to a publisher, they encouraged me to write a book for teens or at least tweens. I did, I came back and they said they loved it. They said, write a trilogy. And I was like, me? You want me to write a trilogy? So I did, three books for children. And in the meantime, wrote a book for adults, which went on the New York Times bestseller list. It's such a powerful story for myself to say out loud because that label, bad writer, was not true. I had given it to myself, I had hung on to it, and I really didn't allow the years, I mean decades of writing I could have been doing. I'm so glad that I finally got that out of the way and now I have these beautiful friends, family, and certainly coworkers that believe in me. I'm gonna keep writing because even though the trilogy is complete, Helicity, the character that I dreamed of for so long, her adventures are far from over. We've looked at primary and secondary sources and the stories they tell. We've talked to people whose jobs rely on creative, clear communication. And during this global pandemic, we've all learned new creative ways to communicate. Which got us thinking, how would we communicate with our future selves or even historians? So we decided to put together a little time capsule. So each of us on the team is gonna put something into the time capsule and I decided to put a mask in there to remind me of all the precautions that we took this year. I'm putting in the month of March, 2020, the month I walked out of our office not knowing when I'd go back to work. One of our producers, Paul, wanted us to put in a bottle cap of his favorite soda. One of our producers, Ryan, has been doing a lot of Legos, so we're putting in a Lego man. One of our editors, Devin, she wanted a copy of the script put in to remember all of the work that she's done in 2020. Our producer, John, wanted to put in an SD card filled with photos of us together, apart, socially distanced, and masked. And we asked some of our middle school friends what they would want to put into a time capsule. Check it out. Hi, my name is Ivy, and I would like to put a journal slash diary inside the time capsule because you can read how someone felt in the past. Hello, my name is Angelo, and I would like to put an iPad in a time capsule so people can see what technology was like in 2020. Hi, my name is Emily, and I will put one of my old drawings in a time capsule because in the future I expect my drawing to be much better. A time capsule can be as small as a candy tin, or it can be as big as the largest box you have. You can bury it in your yard, or you can stick it under your bed. Just put those little reminders inside, and in 20 years, who knows what it'll communicate? Maybe a historian will find it, or it'll end up in our archives. What would you put into a time capsule? Something personal? Something funny? Something that communicates the spirit of time? Let us know in the comments section. And if you like today's show, be sure to follow STEM and 30 on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.